Okay, that's top of the hour. I guess we'll give it a, a few more minutes for people to trickle in, but I guess still, you know, if people could, start, should probably start doing the question if, if anybody would like to volunteer to take notes. I need to be, um, terribly you know detailed just uh, action items and decisions is really all we need and you can use the uh, the note taking tool which is linked from the web uh, from this conference at the top right do we have a jabber scribe also um i'm not positive we need one in this context but uh, if somebody wants to volunteer for that that would probably be good too. Uh, um, oh no, I have on Java if people need uh, something said. Great, thank you, James. James Grazing. Grazing. Sorry, I don't know how to pronounce your last name. Yes, you don't have to use the uh, note-taking tool hedge doc if you don't want to. If you want to take notes yourself and email them to us, that would be fine too. Don't volunteer all at once, but <laughs> yes. Yeah, we, we really do need this. I guess we can start calling on people, eh, Jonathan? <laughs> yeah, I guess so. <laughs> uh, Bo, can we call upon your services as a note taker? Sure, I can take notes. Thanks, Mo. Okay. Uh, just a few meeting tips. This session is being recorded. Uh, you do need a data tracker login, and hopefully that all worked. I know it was problematic earlier in the week. You can join the session Jabber Room, Jabber Room via the meeting agenda, although I'm not sure why you'd need to. Please use headphones or an echo-canceling speakerphone, and state your full name before speaking so that we can get it in the notes. Uh, you enter the queue with a hand raising tool and leave with it as well. You do need to enable your audio, audio to be heard and unmute yourself. Uh, you don't have to enable video if you don't want to. Here's the note well, a reminder of ITF policies. Uh, by participating, you agree to follow these policies, which are listed below, BCP 9 through 79. Please read them and understand them. In addition uh, to the IPR policies, we do have a policy on guidelines for conduct, an anti-harassment policy and procedures. If you're having concerns about observed behavior, please talk to the ombuds team. And we do strive to create an environment in which people are treated with dignity, decency, uh, and respect. And we expect you to behave according to professional standards and demonstrate appropriate workplace behavior. So if you believe you've been harassed or notice that someone else is being harassed or have any other concerns, please talk to the ombuds persons. Right, as Jonathan mentioned, we have uh, the notes on the note-taking tool at this link. Uh, the agenda has been posted and we have the job scribe and note takers. And this is the agenda. Uh, do we have any additions or subtractions? Or modifications. Okay, hearing none, we will move on to the draft status. Why don't you want to cover this, Jonathan? Um, 
Yeah, I think it's the only the only new thing is RFC ninety one thirty four from the publishers publications. Right? Yeah, right. Yeah, I think yeah. So uh, yeah, JPEG XS has been published, so good work there. Um, let's see. Yeah, uh, uh, VP nine is in the RFC editor queue. It's waiting on um, LRR, which is waiting on uh, frame marking. Uh, we did a pub rec on Cryptex. Uh, so that should go through the ADs soon. Uh, frame marking, uh, as of about an hour ago, this notice uh, incorrect. We needed uh, th we needed an updated draft because we decided to change it to experimental. Uh, Mo published that this morning. So now um, I will do the write-up on that and hopefully that should get done. Uh, we dropped Tetra a while ago. We'll probably dropped this from the draft status too. Uh, the next, as of next time, so. If anybody that is in Tetra, let us know. But in the meantime, we can ignore that. And um, we uh, adopted a few drafts. Um, and I'm blanking on which one 7983. I'm blanking on which one 7983 is. I'm sorry. This. That's uh, quick multiplexing. Oh, quick multiplexing. Right, right, right. Yes. Yeah, so, uh, but we, I think, and all our other milestones are going to be discussed uh, here today. So yeah, so VVC is both adopted and in first working group last call. But there were a lot of comments there from mostly from the VVC community itself. So it's great that they're participating here, uh, and uh, we'll definitely be talking about that later. All right. So now I'm uh, going to talk briefly, hopefully, about recent liaison statements. We have a request from the W3C Web Transport Working Group, and Jan Ivar is here to talk a little bit about that. And then we have a liaison from ISO IEC JTC1 SC29 Working Group 3 about green metadata. So, uh, Jan Ivar. All right, can you hear me? We can. Hello, uh, yes, I'm Jan Ivar Gurri from Mozilla. I co-chair the W3C Web Transport Working Group, uh, where one of our use cases is bi-directional real-time audio-video communication over web transport, uh, which is a JavaScript API on top of IETF Web Transport and QUIC. Uh, and the problem we're having there is uh, when sending video, uh, when, a, when a client is sending video to a server, and the problem there is the client does not have enough information to know what it can when it can reapply a multiplicative increase in the media send rate to recover from prior congestion. So basically, uh, we can reduce uh, we can reduce send rate in in the face of congestion, but we don't know how to rapidly reapply a send rate a faster send rate uh, afterwards when the congestion goes away. So the request is to know if, uh, so, so we're glad to hear that this working group is uh, considering RTP over QUIC. And we, we're concerned, we we would like to know if RTP over QUIC can satisfy this use case. And if so, what measurements could a browser make available to a JS client to assist with this problem? And would it perhaps require uh, some form of selectable, replaceable, even congestion control uh, and if so, which algorithms? Thank you. Yeah, I would, I would caution uh, Yanivar that uh, RTP over web transport or uh, is a little bit different from RTP over quick. So maybe we'll get into that in the in the session to follow uh, because it's it's not yeah. as tightly coupled. But so uh, I guess can you raise some of these issues in the discussion that follows, and we'll try to see where to go from there. Does that make sense? Okay, we'll do. Okay. Uh, the second liaison is from ISO IEC JTC1 SC29 Working Group 03. Do we have a representative uh, to talk about this liaison request? I see. Uh, see what cards? See, yeah, I hope I'm pronouncing that right in the queue. Um, are you, so feel free, go ahead. Hi, uh, can you hear me? So, yes, we can. 
Yes, I can uh, speak on that. My colleagues uh, worked on this. Uh, so uh, if it's OK, I can go through. Please. Uh, so this is uh, from group uh, three, Epic Systems. And they would like to point an update on the progress of uh, this standard 23001-11, which is energy efficient media consumption green metadata. Uh, this has been uh, so 2015, 19, first and second editions, and now it's, uh, the third edition is uh, currently in the committee draft uh, CV status. And just in, as an overview, uh, in general, this standard uh, provides uh, various type of metadata that enable uh, management of uh, the, there are these four bullets, uh, management of decoder power consumption or display power consumption, and for offline um, applications or for uh, like adaptive streaming or dash applications, it provides uh, media selection uh, metadata and also uh, quality recovery for uh, video encoding uh, power consumption. So different kind of metadata are provided in this specification. And recently, the third edition of this standard, uh, which is uh, which is pointed to in this LS, provides a bunch of new features. Uh, so for example, these three bullets say here, they, there's now uh, interactive signaling for remote uh, decoder power reduction that gives better power reductions. And also VVC SEI messages uh, for carrying green metadata uh, related to complexity metrics. This has been added and also VVC SEI messages that can also carry uh, metrics for quality recovery after low power encoding. So a bunch of new features have been added and uh, I hope that this information is of interest to this group and uh, we can consider uh, using this in this group. Uh, these different metadata have all a very different uh, shape and form. Some are for live applications, some are for uh, stream, um, adaptive streaming applications, um, and some are forward direction from sender to receiver, some are from receiver side to the sender side. So my imagination is that the, the, uh, the metadata that is to be transferred from receiver to the sender side, that's something especially where, you know, some container formats and so on might be of interest. Uh, group. I, that's my take on it. So that was just like a quick one minute summary on this uh, LS. And if there are questions, I can try to answer them. I see James. Uh, reading through this, it looks like you're targeting VVC. Is there any interest in porting this to other potentially older codecs that are in more use today? It, it, this is the third edition that now adds VVC, but uh, already there are metrics for older codecs available. So uh, yes, they are already in the previous editions. Okay. Uh, so, question question would be have you any real world deployment of these previous editions I mean the stuff is around now for a few years right that is uh, where I don't have any confused information if there's anybody else on this call I'm also fairly new to this uh, Okay, maybe we can take it on reflector and so on, so we can have uh, some more discussion. Is there any action required of the ABT core working group other than discussion on the mailing list? I mean, it it seeks some feedback um, of interest from the from the group. So, yeah. Uh, I mean, I think you know if. You know, insofar it's uh, I guess that's not one of the elements is the receiver to sender feedback. So um, I think if somebody is wants, you know is interested in uh, submitting a draft on that, I think we would certainly um, you know, be you know interested in it, and we can take up with the if the work group wants to do it. But I think, yeah, certainly I think any sort of uh, receiver uh, to sender feedback over our TCP uh, is in scope for this group. So if somebody wants to do that work. Uh, I think there would be interest in that. I mean, assuming there's interest in it in the community. Yeah, that probably should be noted in the minutes. Mm -hmm. 
So I will resume then. Uh, we can do some email communication on this uh, on the lecture. Absolutely. All right. Okay. Thank you. Uh, you next Stephane? topic is RTP no, over. Yeah. Hold on. So, so Stefan and Colin are in the queue. Okay. So just uh, just one remark that uh, if if someone were interested in this type of stuff, then uh, of course the forward direction is also something. I mean, a lot of this gets, as far as I understand, a lot of this can get piggy packed into the codec, uh, into the codec bitstream using SAI messages and such. But uh, it could also be multiplexed uh, by simply creating its own payload format, right? And um, uh, that way, it may be applicable also to non MPEG standards. So, it, I mean, see, what I want to say is the uh, uh, um, uh, uh, chances to work on that are not limited to to uh, the return direction. Yeah, there's, there's a lot done in this in this area. Um, whether it's worth doing it, you know, that we'll see. Yeah, thank you. Fair enough. Fair enough. Tom? Tom? Yeah, hi. Um, so so I, I wanted to return back to the, the first liaison statement, just briefly talking about uh, congestion control. Um, and um, it, it would seem that um, you know, the, the issues of congestion control are coming up in a bunch of different groups. Um, and and, and the, the media over quick side meeting was talking about this and uh, it, it's come up in a, a bunch of different places. Uh, and certainly for um, congestion control for RTP or UDP, I, I know we had the, the RMCAT group, uh, which tried to do a bunch of algorithms. Um, and I, I'm not sure those algorithms directly apply to quick. So, so I'm not suggesting we take the work there, but I'm, I was wondering if uh, we should maybe have a broader conversation about where we do um, media congestion control over quick and, and whether that's sort of RTP specific or, or a more general conversation. So it's maybe something we should bring it with the ADs at some point. Yeah. Well, I think the presentation to follow, uh, Colin, will directly uh, bear on that question. So maybe we can we can talk about it uh, during the presentation or in the Q&A. Sure. sure. I, I think it's more general than um, RTP over quick. quick mm, yeah. But, yeah. Anyone else in the queue? No, that seems to be it. So it's okay. One of the representation. All right. So uh, we're now going to hand it over to the RTP over Quick team. Yeah. Hi. Can you hear me? Yes. Cool. Uh, yeah. Thanks for inviting us to present here again today. Um, in July, we already presented the mapping of RTP onto Quick draft. And today we would like to go a bit more into detail on congestion control for RTP over quick. Uh, on the next slide, um, I'd like to start with a short overview on the context of the draft. Um, there are actually two similar drafts. Uh, the other one is from Sam Hurst from BBC Research and Development. And both drafts provide a basic encapsulation for RTP and RTPC, RTCP over quick. Um, both of the drafts use the unreliable datagram extension with a flow identifier to demultiplex uh, different RTP sessions. And our draft focuses a bit more on congestion control and the interface requirements for quick implementations and congestion controlling. And yeah, both drafts use SDP for signaling. Um, uh, Harold, did you have a question? Or are you just getting in the queue to talk? I'm oh, sorry, go ahead, Matt. This side. Harold just wanted to respond. Okay. Uh, oh, uh, there he is. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, no, I read through the draft and couldn't figure out why he want, wanted to, to carry uh, multiple RTP sessions or one quick session. 
And this might be obvious to someone, but it doesn't seem to be in the draft. Uh, and it's, uh, it's a few bytes of text that I would like to avoid if we don't need it. Uh, sorry, I'm not sure I understand the question. Is that saying, you you have a you put the flow ID into the in, into the into the session. Uh, why do you why do you to demultiplex RTP sessions? Why do you need to to demultiplex RTP sessions? Ah, okay, yeah, uh, that is because in UDP um, one would probably typically use different um, UDP ports and do different RTP sessions over different UDP ports and identify them by that. And in Quick we can. Um, have the RTP sessions in one connection and then try to um, use all of the information we have available in that one connection to use for different RTP sessions at the same time, like for example the congestion control information. I was trying to find, I was trying to figure out the use case where I would want to have multiple RTP sessions on, uh, between the same entities and I couldn't find one. So, uh, so I was wondering whether it's, uh, it, it's, uh, reasonable to drop this requirement and just say if you if you need more RTP sessions set up more quick set quick connections yeah um, maybe I'll take that and we can expand that on the draft and explain it a bit further especially explain the need for it yeah Colin yeah, I mean, the, there was a comment in the chat about not understanding what RTP session meant in this context. I mean, you know, RTP session has a very well-defined meaning in, in the RTP spec, and we, we need to make sure that, that what's meant here is uh, consistent with that meaning and is not just being used as a uh, as an alternative to the SSRC, for example, for, for demultiplexing users. Um, so I, I think there's, there's a, perhaps a deeper conversation about sessions and demultiplexing that, that should happen at some point. Okay, then maybe I continue with the presentation on congestion controlling first and we keep that on a later discussion. Um, yeah, so today we want to focus on the congestion controlling and um, we identify a couple of questions which come up when we do RTP over quick. And first is that um, we have congestion control in quick and RTP and quick suggests to use an algorithm similar to new reno uh, it does not mandate mandate any congestion control algorithm and it rather provides a set of connection statistics that can be used by any congestion controller and other algorithms than new reno are currently under investigation and rtp also provides its own congestion control using um, explicit congestion control signaling in rtcp uh, for example, there's RFC 8888, which provides a feedback format that can be used for algorithms. Um, for example, for algorithms like Scream and NADA and also GCC as proposed by the RMCAT group. Um, now, the two main questions we try to um, investigate in our experimentations are first, how can we do congestion control for Rita media on a, on top of Quick, which already has its own congestion control on another level. And then the second is if we can reduce RTCP overhead uh, due to duplicate signaling of um, congestion signaling in Quick and RTCP. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so we did um, experiments with a couple of different options we could use for congestion control. Uh, the first one is that we try to leave congestion control entirely to quick and only do some trivial rate adaption in our media application. Um, we will leave that out today because it's um, we already know that it's probably better to have a um, congestion control algorithm which is specified for real time and we would rather look at these today. Um, the next option is that we disabled Quick's internal congestion control and we only use the real-time congestion controller like we would use, for example, over UDP, like the algorithms from my MCAT. Um, 
in our experiments, we use Scream because this uh, existing implementation for Scream was quite easy to integrate in our setup. And then in the last um, combination, we used Scream and New Reno together. And uh, on the next slide, I have a couple of notes on how to reduce RTCP feedback. Um, we would like to use the quick connection stats, which are already available in the transport protocol to um, reduce the RTCP overhead. And in Quick, we have the datagram draft, which allows an implementation to expose the datagram acknowledgments to the application. And we're using this to um, identify which RTP packets have arrived at the receiver. Um, we keep track of the sent RTP packets and in which datagrams they were sent and at what time they were sent. So we have the timestamp and as soon as an acknowledgement arrives, we know that this RTP packet has been received. And then we also use the RTT samples provided by the quick connection statistics um, to infer a receive timestamp at which the packet arrived at the receiver by just adding half of the RTT, uh, the last known RTT to the send timestamp we kept track of earlier. Uh, the next slide, I have a short overview of our test implementation. Um, we integrated quick go with GStreamer and the screen implementation. Um, the um, application transmit video data in RTP packets from one sender to a receiver. Um, using GStreamer to encode and packetize RTP packets, which are then uh, prepended with the flow identifier we talked about earlier and sent to the receiver. Um, the receiver takes the um, RTP packet and it identifies the RTP session and forwards the data from the packet to the corresponding GStreamer pipeline. And um, then we use a slightly modified version of Quick Go to be able to selectively disable new Reno in our experiments and also to expose the connection statistics and the datagram acknowledgements. Uh, we build a test bed setup on the next slide, please. Yes, I had a question about the, uh, the timestamp feedback um, from from what I understand, the, the purpose of that in RTCP is for congestion controls to understand the one-way delay, uh, to, to understand variance in one-way delay, and those delay-sensitive algorithms um, can use that high-fidelity one-way delay inferencing um, from that. But if you're basing, if you're trying to synthesize that using round-trip times, it seems like you've lost the one-way delay aspect of that, which may be important for some of those uh, uh, some of those congestion control algorithms. Uh, yeah, I think we will get back to that in a later slide on the results for this inferring. And okay. there are drafts, um, or quite recent drafts, which also try to use the um, receive timestamps directly in acknowledgements of a reference up later. Uh, yeah, next slide, please. So we have a test bad setup in which we run both of the applications in separate uh, containers on the same host. And we use um, the virtual network interfaces in the containers to uh, simulate different network conditions. Um, we configure the bandwidth limit of one megabit per second, and we run the experiments with different one-way delays. And after set 60 seconds of a video run, uh, of a video transmission, we reduce the available link capacity to 500 kilobit per second to see how the algorithms and the transport react to this. And then our application logs incoming and outgoing RTP and RTCP packets for analysis afterwards. And um, we also calculate PSNR and SM statistics on the raw video flights. Uh, next slide, please. So the first results for um, screen using RTP over uh, for RTP over quick using stream screen and comparing this to UDP. Um, the left graph shows the quick 
implementation and the right one UDP. And we can see that the results are quite similar. So it seems to be possible to, to use um, quick datagrams to transmit RTP. And um, we can also see that the um, target bit rate of the screen condition control are slightly below the one in UDP. Uh, we're not exactly sure why yet, maybe due to some overhead, but we need to investigate that further. Um, on the next slide. So we hold on. <clears throat> the screen plus quick is just the quick congestion control replaced by screen, right? Yes. OK. Uh, then on the next slide, we um, leave the quick congestion controller enabled and we congestion control the real-time traffic by screen before we put it to quick. So everything um, goes through the both congestion controllers and we see that in the first uh, part of the video transmission, it seems to behave very similar to the previous slide, um, but that probably is due to application limited transmission. So as long as screen is um, sending less data than Urino would, uh, then we are in this uh, yeah, application limited state where um, Urino doesn't really do much yet. But as soon as then the link capacity is reduced to 500 kilobit per second for 30 seconds, uh, we see that both congestion controllers uh, try to um, adapt to the new link capacity and the, the screen target bit rate drops to almost zero and the ramp up also does not happen um, at all in the, in the case of a one millisecond delay. It may be that that happens much later if we looked in it, into it for a longer time, but this is already not really usable, so we didn't investigate that further. And in the second case of a um, one way delay with 15 milliseconds, it, it seems to be ramping up, but also only much later after it the target grid rate already dropped to zero earlier. Um, then on the next slide, we show some results for uh, trying to reduce RTCP overhead. Uh, on the left side, we see the results with um, RTP over quick using RTCP feedback. And on the right side, RTP over quick using only the inferred feedback I described earlier. Um, we can see that the, um, the the top two experiments looks pretty similar. So it seems to be possible in general to um, use the quick statistics for RTCP feedback. But we also see that in the later experiments, especially in the one with 150 milliseconds, one way delay, the ramp up in the beginning um, works much slower or starts much slower. And um, we, in our experiments, we generate the feedback at a fixed interval, and we think that the um, instability in the last experiments are due to this fixed generation of um, feedback, which may lead to um, some acknowledgments from Quick arriving after we generate the next feedback, even though the RTP packet has already been received by the receiver, and due to de delayed and um, aggregated X, they only arrive a little bit too late at our sender so that some feedback is not included, which leads to feedback which would be less precise than the one RTCP could provide. Um, there are probably um, two drafts which could uh, improve the situation because there's one draft for uh, quick timestamps, which would give us timestamps for, um, uh, which would help us to estimate the one-way delay, as we already talked about earlier. And then there's a very recent draft which gives um, timestamps for uh, received packets, and that would also help to improve the generated feedback, because we then didn't have, wouldn't have to use the um, latest RTT samples anymore, and instead we could just use the feedback which is directly on what we need from Quick instead of inferring it from the feedback which is already present in Quick now. Um, then we have one more slide on prioritization. Um, we ran all the experiments again with the um, second stream opened in Quick. This time not datagrams, but the real Quick stream, which sends constant data. And um, in this 
case, we see that the um, application probably needs some prioritization between real-time data in quick datagrams and background traffic in the same connection um, as um, in our experiment, we see that the um, target bit rate quickly degrades and it might even starve um, because of the background data. And uh, yeah, there's then probably some better scheduling of prioritization necessary. Um, but this is also a very artificial setup in our experiments because we really send a lot of background data and there are probably um, better experiments needed with more natural forms of um, background traffic, like um, on-off HTTP requests or something like that, instead of constant sending uh, data. Um, yeah, then on the last slide, I come to the conclusion. Um, I think there are mainly three results we have here. So the first one is that it's probably problematic to run two separate congestion control loops at the same time, um, like a real-time congestion control algorithm like Screen for the real-time data and um, something like New Reno and Quick at the same time for all of the outgoing uh, data on the connection. Um, and the second is that it's probably possible to use Quick state information to reduce RTCP feedback, uh, but that could probably also profit from some optimizations which would be provided by the uh, receive timestamp draft or something similar which could, would give more detailed information than just the RTT and using this RTT for the um, feedback info. And then the last point is that some prioritization is necessary um, as we've seen on the last slide. Uh, yeah, in the future, we plan to do some more experiments on different congestion control algorithms and different forms of computing traffic and different network topologies. And we would also like to um, try to find some way to do better prioritization than no prioritization at all to see how we can use one quick connection for real-time data and non-real-time data at the same time. Yeah, uh, I think so far. Justin McHugh. Hey, can you hear me? Yep. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, this is this is really good work. Uh, I'm, I'm glad to see this kind of moving forward. Uh, I guess I have three points here that I think are uh, would be good for us to try to limit scope um, here. Uh, one would be, you know, is there anything besides receive timestamp that we need to have the same information that that RTP or, or what we had here as uh, UDP um, would have? Um, because if, I think if we get there, then we can feel pretty confident that uh, we have everything at a protocol level to do uh, good for real time congestion control. Second thing is that, uh, you know, I think trying to prioritize real time and non real time right now uh, might be like, cutting off a lot. Uh, and then we might just say open a different quick connection for you know, non real time stuff because that's how it works today. Uh, and not to say that that's where we stop, but that might be a good milestone of saying that we just basically replace the entire congestion controller if we do RTP flows today and get that working over quick. And I think that would be a pretty good accomplishment. Uh, and then last, one thing we haven't really talked about here is sort of overhead of um, you know, how many more bytes are we putting on the wire for each RTP packet, you know, and where are we sending redundant RTCP feedback? And it would be good to sort of dive into that and see you know, what those numbers are, and then we start thinking about, is there anything that can be done to, to, to mitigate that? Yeah, I, uh, I, I think I agree with all of the points you said. Um, yeah. Uh, Sergio? Sergio, I don't hear you. Sergio, see if you can figure out your audio in the meantime, sue us. Uh, 
I'm not hearing Suhas either. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, now you Yes, yes, I do. Okay, so I just wanted to echo on some point and make an observation on what Justin made. And also a clarification question is, uh, uh, so uh, to the present was, uh, uh, was there any specific reason why uh, RTP uh, uh, was considered for this investigation is that was it was a reason because some sort of, some sense of interoperability with existing RTP stacks or 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 uh, was that a protocol of choice to pick? I just want to understand the uh, context behind that. Can you hear me now? Yes. <laughs> okay, <laughs> stupid. So I, I had the, the headset muted even I spoke. Okay. okay. So <laughs> um, I think let's, I'd like to let Mathis respond to Sarah's first. Yeah. Uh, sorry, I'm not sure I understand the question. It was a bit hard to understand. I'm sorry. Yeah, okay. that that first is uh, that's I think that this is our song work. And if you have the code there to replicate the results and maybe it is on our own. Uh, yeah, we have we have the code. Um, it is on GitHub, but it's not pro probably uh, good documented right now. Mm -hmm. But we plan to do that soon. Yeah, I, I was also interested in how to replicate the, the network adaptation and things like that. So because the code is typically available, but the the how how to replicate the actual test is could be interesting as well. Yeah, we can share that definitely. Okay, and the second thing is that I think that the um, one thing that it is also related to the web transport thing is that this uh, kind of test seems to be very focused on what a native application can do by modifying or integrating deeply with the with the quick stack or providing or but in if we are using web transport uh, I think that we have to consider also what will happen if the if the bound one estimation is going to be run in JavaScript because probably the, the browser will not provide a de facto bound one estimation for the application level. Uh, how can we make this work when the, the the application that it is using the quick stack is untrusted? For example, uh, we are going to replace the, the RTCP feedback from from this quick feedback, uh, how this will be exposed to the application because I think that they will impact quite a lot in what we will be able to do with with transport. Um, yeah, I think um, this is very much focused on our native application right now, which we built for testing. And there will probably um, be a need for more broader discussion on API things in the future. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because for example, I, I doubt that we can just disable the the quick congestion control and let the application uh, on running on JavaScript uh, just do uh, behave properly. So we will have to find a way of trying to have both working simultaneously. In a, or, uh, I think that it was uh, sometime proposed that have some circuit breakers in case the, the bandwidth estimation done by the application is to is not behaving properly or things like that. But but anyway, I think that it is a, a very great work that you have done so far and so just hope to be able to improve it. Thanks. I guess Bernard, you're next up. As as you can, you can. Uh, I guess I had uh, wanted to focus on some of the questions Yana Ivar asked. Um, which is, uh, I guess, your, your paper has the different metrics that you've uh, been using. And I guess most of those are probably exposable in web transport, um, including the, the timestamp info. I guess the one thing that wouldn't potentially be exposable is the detailed act data, uh, because um, in a browser, basically, you can't assume that the, that the acts reflect the application. Uh, what it got, but maybe uh, uh, the the timestamp uh, and other info from the acts uh, could be could be provided up. I guess, uh, yeah. And and originally in web transfer, we did have the concept of uh, adding uh, a congestion control selector to the constructor. And I guess to Justin's point, that would be on a quick connection level. Um, so I guess um, one thing to think about would be if you had separate quick connections instead of the prioritization thing operating with different congestion control algorithms 
um, what the behavior might be there. Uh, and also, Web, web Transport does have uh, prioritization built in, but it's probably of the kind that your research shows is going to be problematic, uh, which is basically right now the datagrams get get uh, absolute priority. Um, so they will starve out the, uh, the reliable streams. Um, yeah, I think we could do more experiments on that in Web Transport, especially on the prioritization. And um, yeah, I agree that it might be hard to uh, expose all of the data we use in our experiments yet. Um, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Spencer? I just wanted to thank you for uh, bringing this work uh, forward uh, and thanks to the chairs for bringing this uh, forward in, uh, in AV, AVT Core. Uh, the question I probably or the suggestion I have is uh, this draft did not actually flag AVT core in the file name. And I've been having some conversations on the media over quick uh, mailing list, which is only a mailing list, uh, about, about another draft that's relevant here that doesn't have AVT core in the name. It, it was focused on uh, the SVP for. Uh, for RTP over quick, but uh, recognizing that that was going to have a you know a lot of uh, a lot was going to have to reflect a lot of discussions about uh, what RTP over quick was actually going to look like. Uh, are we for the chairs? Are we, are we to the point where we should be putting ABT core in the in the draft names to get more visibility within the group here? Um, I mean, I don't know is the short answer. I mean, because I mean, I, we don't know if this is ultimately going to end up in AVT core. I mean, visibility is oh, always yeah. good. Oh, yeah, I understand yeah. that. Yeah, I, I'm thinking yeah. mostly from the standpoint of making sure the right people are looking at it. Um, and you, yeah, all, I mean, and how, you, all, you all can think about that then. Yeah, I'll just think about that. Yeah, yeah, sure. The, the, the discussions we've been having for uh, my draft in this space and uh, the over in the mock uh, mailing list are I think they're definitely ready uh, to move into uh, ABC core or a group like that rather than kind of an ad hoc overall media over quick discussion yeah I mean so, insofar as things are you know RTP ish feel free to target them at ABT core it's you know cool. it doesn't hurt anything if we're wrong thank you thank you so much yeah, yeah. Bernard? Yeah, hi. Um, so, I mean, there's a bunch of discussion in the, in the chat about sort of short-term and long-term approaches. Uh, and I, I think that's important. I think uh, we, we should make sure we have that broader sort of architectural conversation about where we want to go rather than necessarily just the sleepwalking into into reusing our, our TP here. Um, the, the 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 actual reason I, I, I got up to the mic was um, you know that the comments about using separate connections to avoid having the the congestion control prioritization discussion. Uh, I mean, separate connections causes quite a lot of pain in in the current model, um, and. Um, we, we we should uh, have a de have a deliberate discussion about whether we we think that's acceptable pain or whether we want to you know, tr make a conscious effort to reduce that and f try to make everything run over a single connection even if it means more congestion control and, and prioritization work James? Uh, thank you. Thank you for doing this work. Uh, the question that I have is you've only looked at doing this in the unidirectional flow, right? This is just a sender, a one sender, one receiver, one flow of media, correct? Yes, true. Cool. Uh, in our experimentations, it is probably 
possible to build something else with the draft, but that's what we experimented with, yeah. Cool. I think that when we, sort of tagging on from uh, Colin's last remark around connections and, and just various thoughts around how multiplexing might be dealt with in this space, bidirectional flows of media should also be considered as well. Um, we've had an awful lot of discussions earlier this week in the, the media of uh, the MOQ side meeting and, and in other sort of forums around those use cases. And I think that there may be, and this is a hand wave, uh, potential issues when it comes to uh, com conflicts, competition between congestion control, depending on which way we tackle the conductivity and multiplexing of the sessions. Uh, yeah, that's probably true. Um, we were planning to, um, or our current test set setup is kind of inspired by the test uh, cases evaluation for congestion control from RMCAT, but they don't completely implement all of it. Um, and yeah, as I said, we would like to do more experimentations with that, and then we should probably also include bidirectional streams there. Uh, Justin? Uh, so I just want to sort of add on to the comments point uh, where you sort of mentioned that, well, maybe we should take on, uh, you know, prioritization. And, you know, I think that's where any uh, specific work in this area, we probably want to have a good sense of what our goals are. Uh, you know, what would count as good enough? What would count as like a reasonable V1? Uh, what what things do we think we have to do? Uh, I think as often has shown, we can get you know, some results, uh, even just now, just by sort of encapsulating RTP with Quake Datagram. But what would be necessary for us to kind of consider is something that we want to be play on, uh, whether it's overhead, whether it's packet rate optimization. Uh, you know, this is still an early draft, so this is fine where it is right now. But as this moves forward, I think kind of lining up as a, a working group, what do we think that, you know, they should be trying to solve, uh, I think would help us all kind of get to a shared picture of, of where we want to end up. Uh, yep, f f fully agree with all of that. Okay, and we're kind of over time, but this is an area with a lot of interest, so I figured we would let us go over. But thank you all, and I guess discussion um, probably on the APT uh, list um, or the mock list or both. Um, probably, if you're interested in this, you should be subscribed to both, but hopefully we can try to converge on where we're having the discussion. Um, and yes, Ben, to the authors, please continue your experiments. It's very helpful. Uh, Sergio? Yep. Thanks. So please, uh, please. Yeah, we uh, have... Hold, yep. hold, hold on one second. Spencer, are you trying to do something with slides? or? No, you're okay. Okay, go ahead, Sergio. Yeah, uh, the, we have released. Uh, Hold on, Spencer. Spencer, are you trying to say something? No, okay. I don't know. So there's. Okay, sorry. Sorry, Sergio. <laughs> okay, so we have been, uh, put a new draft uh, for Critics that it is uh, does to clarification. One was the authentication after encryption and also how the what the, the what's the meaning of the crystal attribute when it is present in, with 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 bundle um, it does not change the anything uh, on the draft it's just clarification say that were needed because it was not clear at the moment uh, regarding the implementation status we still have only two implementations currently one is uh, done by by you jonathan uh, that in the NTC, mm -hmm. and the, the pull request that I have for, for Libes RTP, that I, it is not yet merged, but I hope that it will be soon. And we the uh, we have uh, it has been requested for publication, and uh, we are already also trying to have a, an issue open for for adding the API for enable and disable it in WebRTC. So. I think that that's all, and I think that there is nothing uh, up, 
well, for the the review, but uh, we will just do, do no, need to do the review. But I think that there is nothing uh, pending to to be done in in the in the current draft. There one more slide. Yeah. Okay. So, all right. Yes, I think that's in good shape, and it's yeah. in the hands of our AD now. So, hopefully, that will get will be done quickly. Uh, and Stefan, are you presenting? Yes. Yeah. Hi. Um. No, that is uh, uh, the two payload formats for VVC and EVC. Okay, a quick thing. Next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so we had a working group last call uh, a few weeks ago, a few months ago, actually. And uh, we got comments uh, from Belmont, uh, from Miska, and from Henry. And uh, they were, uh, all in all, uh, the the the, the um, activity on the mailing list in response to this working group last call was quite active. Uh, we had more than 30 emails there. Um, and uh, the comments were also quite extensive. And uh, but over the time, I think uh, we got to a good understanding of what uh, the commenters were uh, asking, and I think we addressed most of them uh, in this uh, version number twelve, uh, which was posted uh, just before the deadline. And. Uh, we have a number uh, a revision number thirteen in the in the works um, that is currently uh, reviewed by the authors, where Miska actually uh, put in uh, some additional text uh, related to the remaining issue somewhere deep down in the upper answer, um, and that's I mean I I, I can promise it for uh, pretty quickly. Um, What's a little bit concerning to me is that uh, our usual suspects here on this uh, in this working group uh, didn't comment at all, yeah, except Belmont. And um, but I would guess that uh, that's perhaps because all these uh, uh, payload formats for for um, null unit based codecs are so similar nowadays that that. Perhaps most of the bugs have been ironed out uh, much earlier, but I, really, if, it, it would be good if, if people uh, could take one more look at it at, at some point. Um, now, I, I think the real test will come uh, when this thing goes out to publication request and uh, uh, all these uh, uh, security guys uh, come out of the woods and, and talk about the newest trend uh, that they want to see in the security sections, uh, and similar, maybe the congestion control guys. I don't know. So, um, yeah. And well, so what we will be doing is we'll publish one more uh, revision of the BBC draft uh, pretty soon. I, I gave you a target date uh, mid of the month, but we will do that earlier, I think. Uh, probably as soon as later today. And then uh, um, we suggest that maybe another working group last call is adequate since the text changes are uh, not insubstantial, um, although they are deep down in the details uh, where where the VVC codec uh, maps to the offer answer uh, mostly. And uh, then I think we're ready for, after that working group last call, for publication request. Um, next slide, please. Thanks, Bernard. Now, this was an issue that's more a generic uh, question uh, that uh, was triggered by a, Bernard, by a comment from Bernard, uh, where he said there are no complete examples of the SDP of our answer negotiation. In the draft, that was in in the context, I think, mostly of the scalability uh, uh, related, rather complex of answer scenarios that this uh, draft would allow. Um, 
And uh, that raises a little bit the philosophical question of uh, what good do examples do? Yeah, the, um, uh, so one thing that I've seen uh, rather consistently in implementations by people who are not, say, uh, regular participants of this group is that they take code snippets from the uh, from the um, drafts, or at, at least you know the examples verbatim from the drafts, uh, hack a little bit around them um, for the special needs they may have, and think that they have uh, uh, something that ought to work with other people's um, uh, implementation. And typically, it does not. Very often, it does not. And the uh, the reason for that is, I think, that people uh, uh, simply take the examples as shortcuts uh, for, um, you know, for for the way how, how things ought to be done and don't really get a full understanding of what's going on. Um, we had this discussion before, a few years ago, uh, or a decade ago or so, um, and in uh, for the HVC payload form, and there we later on decided not to go for full examples. And I just want to kind of reconfirm that that's the right thing to do. Um, I mean, we we can add more examples if we absolutely need to, but for the reasons I stated, we are. It's not laziness. It's really it's it's more. Um, you know, I I, I think. Examples teach away too much from uh, from the the complexity of the problems uh, that are hidden in those uh, in those um, of our answer uh, cap exchange uh, options that we have in those drafts. So, what uh, I asked this question on the mailing list, there was no response. Um, what do people think? Um, Bernard is okay. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Stefan. I guess what I was responding to in part is, is some of the issues we've seen uh, with implementations and figuring out what they do. Uh, there's a pretty widespread problem now with people inventing their own uh, uh, very different implementations of HEVC, for example. Uh, I had an instance where it was integrated with WebRTC and nobody could figure out what it was doing. Um, and I, I know that's not the fault of the draft because it probably didn't also implement the payload format either. Uh, but uh, yeah, it just, um, I, I understand your point uh, that, uh, but, you know, translating these things into actual implementations uh, has just, it has been problematic because people pick and choose things and uh, you never know what they're going to do until you actually look at it. I, I completely agree. I think uh, the, the disagreement, if there is any, I don't know. Uh, the disagreement is what the cure to this problem is. And right. <laughs> I think the cure is not to uh, to put oversimplified examples in, in a draft that will be copy pasted uh, in that may be known as correct, but may may not be known as applicable for the particular problem that people have, and that people right. go go away from you know frankly from 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 specs for something as comparatively simple as a payload format when you compare it to the video codec. That's, I mean, that's, people take shortcuts. They do it all the time, right? So yeah. unfortunately, I'm not running a standards police. Otherwise, I could, I could do something about it, but I don't. Yeah. So OK, let me put this as a proposal, or let me put that not as a question, but as a, as a statement. So unless people speak up pretty darn soon uh, right now uh, that they want to see more detailed examples, we are not going to add more examples, and we will be, uh, we will be um, referring to this discussion uh, if we come out of the woods later for more examples. No? Yeah, I don't think you need uh, examples to spoon feed people. Um, I don't think that's necessary. But in your view, do you think that the current examples give the high order bit of of what um, of what the important part, most important parts of the draft are trying to convey in their SDP? 
I think that's the useful part because there's usually a lot of text and it's usually, um, you know, what, drafts that have uh, many parameters and, and many rules um, on other parameters, it's, it's hard to lose, it's easy to lose high order bit of, of uh, functional negotiation uh, in all of the different nuances of, of the parameters. So do you feel like you've captured just the high order bits and not all the full complete negotiation? So I, I think, I think we are, we are good enough. Um, if you take this and, and a little bit of say common understanding of how of our answer is supposed to work. Uh, we, we are good for the relatively simple use cases, say no scalability. Right. Once complex stuff comes into the picture, people have to dig in. People have to understand that. You know? Because if you, if, you, if, you, if you just try to create, recreate a scalability model without understanding uh, the, the VVC scalability mechanism, which are not that easy to, to grok, right? Uh, and that that uh, five percent of additional complexity that's being added by the payload format. If if you don't have an if you don't have an, a, a good picture of that and just naively starts implementing, then uh, then you will arrive at something that just doesn't work. So the the uh, but for the for the relatively simple use cases, if you're using uh, say say no scalability or, or temporal scalability only, you should be fine. Then I think it's appropriate to not include detailed examples of all the possible subtleties. Implementers should know those subtleties and and know the STP for them. Okay. Good. Uh, thanks. I think that's all I had on the VVC thing. So that's on track. Um, next slide, please. So jumping over to EVC, uh, that's a really short one. Um, next slide. We haven't uh, reffed the uh, uh, O1 working group draft. Um, this this tradition of keep alive drafts, uh, I I consider, you know, this is this is just not not a good thing. So un unless uh, you chairs tell me that we should uh, run keep alive uh, keep alive drafts uh, um, for bookkeeping purposes or something like that, uh, we're not going to do it. However, the draft is still on our on our internal agenda, and we are uh, committed to to deal with that. However, the the way we want to do that, and that was I think agreed uh, uh, in last summer, is we'll deal with it uh, once we have learned the lessons, and that's especially the lessons I'm expecting on the security side uh, during uh, the ITF last call. So in other words, what we suggest to do is uh, we will produce uh, version two um, after we got uh, the VVC draft through the last call. And then we'll be ready very, very quickly uh, with working group last call of the EVC draft. The alternative would be keep alive if you choose. Uh, if you I, that's I think that's, that's, that sounds reasonable to me, I think. Which one? Uh, sorry, the, the, the not no, no keep alive needed. Just okay. Yeah, yeah. That's um, basically the, all. Question I yeah, the other question yeah. I had is you. So when you're saying security, do you think there'll be sufficient, you know, specific security issues that might come up uh, due to something about VVC, or if, is it just? Okay. No, no. If if there were if there were specific security issues that I'm, I think that would come up, we would have proactively addressed them. No. Okay. Uh, this is this is just uh, doing payload formats for the last twenty years. Something always comes up from that crowd. So uh, I mean, if I, I would be very pleasantly surprised if this time nothing comes up, but something always comes up. So uh, and there's always a need to add a sentence uh, or to uh, to the security uh, consideration question. And frankly, in in the past, that was also the truth for the congestion control. I think this time congestion control is probably not the big issue anymore uh, because those people are watching video payload formats generally nowadays. But on the security side, it's just, I'm, I'm just expecting it without knowing what it may be. OK. OK, thank you very much. OK. Uh, I see Mike Fowler in the 
Thank you. Uh, uh, Daniel or Mike, which are your presenting? Anson with uh, General Dynamics. I was going to have Mike do our presentation for us. Okay, uh, good. Protect, and I'll be certainly be here for questions um, as we go along. Sounds good. Go ahead. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, I've been listening to the uh, the conversations of the others, and I'll, I'll augment the uh, presentation based on some of what I've heard. Um, but as far as I know, the organization we are supporting is is new, or somewhat new, to the IETF. Um, so I provided a couple slides that discuss our background. Um, for the draft RFC that was submitted. Uh, the particular protocol we support is called SCIP, Scared Communications Interoperative Protocol. It began in 1994. Um, I was around for the birth of that uh, as a combined uh, Department of Defense and Vendor Working Group. Uh, the working group was called the Interoperability Control Working Group. Um, this well, the SCIP protocol began in 1994. There were predecessors to it. Um, we go back to the PSTN days uh, of, of early communications that the DOD would do over PSTNs and then into ISDN and migrated into IP. Um, all handled with a, with a community of interest, if you want to call it that. And the community was mostly confined in the US uh, for a large part of this. But the goal of this group was to develop the next generation interoperability security protocols supporting the US government and the military interests. Later, uh, around 2001, to include NATO and NATO partners, and the name changed to the SCIP Working Group. The SCIP Working Group is a functional uh, standards making test um, a community that, that meets one or two times a year, depending upon the needs uh, we have separate uh, action items to do. We have demonstrations to provide. We are a functioning body that's been around for a while. Next slide. One of the problems that's come up is about the SCIP information access and awareness. Um, the SCIP standards are currently available to participating government military communities and select uh, OEMs of network equipment and call management servers that support SCIP. Um, government business entities must request access to relevant information and access to SCIP standards is based upon a need to, to need to know. Now, devices that implement SCIP standards transparently op operate over digital carriers. Um, SCIP is an application layer uh, protocol. It doesn't function down in the network layer. The devices, um, most commercial network and security community personnel are not aware of SCIP, and this can result in a SCIP submedia type SCIP being removed from the SDP of a standard SIP message. So the lack of awareness among the network and security community has become a larger issue as the use of SCIP grows over more commercial carriers and as network security devices become more restrictive of unknown media as a side story to that, uh, my first exposure to, to uh, network security was way back in the early Cisco days of, of building a firewall based on IP addresses. Uh, I think we can all agree it's progressed a lot since then as to what the security appliances do to your network. So we, we have come across issues. Next slide, please. Um, we have come across issues where the SDP doesn't contain the transport that we need. So the draft RFC submitted to IETF is designed to provide information to network equipment, OEMs, network administrators, security personnel, and to help SCIP succeed over the commercial networks. Because SCIP relies on commercial equipment within the network infrastructure to operate. And as it's become, as security policies have changed, devices have changed from being um, where you go in and decide what you're going to not let into your network, now they are more like they're gonna deny all. And you have to tell them what you want into your network. And when that telling gets all the way down into the contents of the SDP, SCIP can have a problem. 
So the SCIP RFC enables network equipment manufacturers to provide an equipment configuration that supports uh, SCIP as a, as a media subtype so that the network administrators, network security personnel can define and implement compatible network policy, which permits the SCIP media subtype to traverse the network. What the SCIP media subtype provides is end-to-end -end bit integrity, no transcoding on the channel, and, and treatment as if the, the, the data is clear channel data. And there is actually a, a precedence to this within the RFC standards of RFC 4040, and we referenced that in the, in the draft uh, submitted. RFC 4040, while it is a gateway protocol, it, it, is, it is meant to take IP traffic and an ISDN BRI uh, network uh, 64K UDI channel and build a end-to-end -end bit integrity network for the users to use whatever they want. So RFC 4040 develops a clear channel. It just happens to transverse, uh, tra go from IP to ISDN 64K UDI. So SCIP is to be treated like that on a pure IP network. Next slide. There are two submedia types that have been registered with IANA as RTP payload format media types, audio skip and video skip. Um, this RFC is needed to provide additional information for those media subtypes where we include the media type description, the payload format RTP header fields, payload format parameters, and the SDP declaration as of the mapping to the SDP and, and provides mapping examples, what you'll see on the next slide, I believe. Next slide. This is the contents of the SDP declaration to support a skip session. I kind of, uh, like most comment of, of, of high order bits, <laughs> this is just simply what will be included in a SIP invite of what would maybe a normal video call with different codecs listed. So the skip devices are presently deployed in the US and NATO tactical networks. Uh, and many national networks and some commercial networks using that following SDP media and submedia type. We have deployed products and have had for over a decade um, using these protocols. So the secure session can be used as audio skip, video skip, or both, and the mapping is shown there. Um, presently, there, I think within the, uh, the global community, my knowledge is, is that there are probably about eight, nine nations producing products using these protocols. Next slide. So in summary, here's, here's our ash, ash, issues have occurred because OEMs and network equipment, um, networks administrators and security personnel are unaware of SCIP and SDP contents necessary to establish secure session. That unawareness is partially tied to the fact that, that this that the, the body of uh, community that this serves is one that has, a, has an already standing community, already has a standing set of standards in which to operate to do this. So it, operating in that environment um, is, is one that produces the fact that while we're defining the end products, but we don't have any way to let the people in the middle know what we do. So the draft RFC increases the ETF awareness of the SCIP working group and its efforts to achieve international interoperability. Um, actually, we'd probably welcome some involvement of the IETF community if they choose to participate in our sessions. Uh, the purpose of the RFC is to provide global access to information necessary to support SCIP. Um, and a reference to the RFC provides context and a single reference point for the newly defined IANA media subtypes, audio skip and video skip. So we have to look at our problem as not just being the end products having interoperability because everyone else who carries traffic is responsible for defining what's on the network, is responsible for building equipment that implements security plans. They need the knowledge to know how to do that. <clears throat> it even goes down as far as the procurement people. If I, as a network designer, want to support this protocol on my network, how do I reference that to a procurement rep so that they can then write a, a, a 
request for quote to vendors saying this is what your product needs to support. So as in the last bullet, the RFC provides information about SCIP and the SCIP working group community system network architects, network administrators, security personnel, OEMs, risk analysts, procurement personnel necessary for SCIP to be included in the system security lifecycle. So that's pretty much it in, in a nutshell. Um, I can respond to questions. I'm not hearing anything. Um, basically, you said that the actual content of the skip is on a is need to know, which is just a um, some form of classification, right? Um, it's not it, the it's basically building a uh, a channel by which the end devices will negotiate what they're going to do. They're going to negotiate applications. They're going to negotiate okay. security parameters. Um, so its format itself is not as clearly defined as if you were carrying uh, movie traffic or, or 729 or something like that. So basically this is just establishing a channel over, you know, a, 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 you know, an opaque application channel over, over the existing RTP session, then you need to integrate this with With the, you know things that use the IP telephony, is that what you're saying? Yes. Okay. Yeah, it, um, and it has been done in some devices. When we've had direct interaction with vendors, we've been able to, um, especially those that are aware of the type of work we do, um, they're saying, "Oh, okay, so this is just kind of the next generation of what was in the previous." In the previous, in the PSDN world, we'd be talking to telcos about what they need to do on their network. But there is no real telco anymore. Bernard? Yeah, so my question is, what is the what can the ABT core working group do for you? So are you, uh, I guess the document is an informational RFC. Are you looking for it to be working group last called? Or uh, what's the ask from us? Um, that, here's, here's where we have to express some ignorance of, your, of, of how the IFC works. So um, for, for our purposes, we, we look at this as uh, uh, the, the adoption of this draft RFC is not the end of the game. Um, we have much more work to do because an RFC doesn't mean anyone's going to implement anything into the product. It takes work beyond that. but an available global reference is a big start. Um, I would ask you, Bernard, what do you, where would something like this go? Because uh, it is, uh, in the end, um, it is the standard that's need to for end products to communicate in the way that they were designed. Um, the recognition that their far end product is a compatible one, and then working over a clear channel establish what each of the users are capable of doing and want to do. Yeah, so I think we have our area director here, uh, Murray. I don't know, Murray, if you want to comment on that. Sorry, if you're speaking, we don't hear you. Oh, why am I not muted? No, no, we hear you. Uh, you can hear me now? Okay. Yes. Um, I was just reading your reading over the charter because it's been a while since I've read it. And as long as um, this is covered in it, which I haven't, I haven't finished reading it yet, and the working group doesn't have any objections to, or the working group supports the idea of bringing it in, since it's informational, um, I don't think this is a problem to take up. But, you know, consensus prevails. But, I mean, as um, an this, example, this we should... the rest of the discussion. Yeah. 
as an example, we could work a group last call it. Uh, it could be published, I guess, through the independent submissions process also. Um, there's a variety of ways to, to get it through the publication process, which seems to be the goal. Is, yeah, is, if you're going for informational, there are, there are several options. Well, that, that can be a discussion we can have offline as to the benefits of one versus the other, because that's uh, also something that I don't know personally. So, Yeah, I think one of the things you're looking for because of the SDP issues is to get the attention of the SDP directorate and some of the people who make these B2B UAs who are torturing you. Uh, so that's kind of another consideration is how to get the most exposure to them. That is true. Um, in a sense, they are uh, participants in how network equipment is created uh, by the RFCs that, that they have endorsed or, or information that they have at their disposal. Okay, I think the action item, and correct me, Jonathan, would be to bring this, this discussion to the mailing list as to uh, how to get this published. The, does, does that make sense to you? That probably makes sense. I do see some people in the queue, but if you keep it quick, we're okay. it over time. Yeah. Yeah. Harold? Yeah, I was uh, struck, by, struck by the similarities of what you want, uh, want uh, intermediate nodes to do with between this and S-Frame, actually. In both cases, the main purpose of the SDP negotiation is to say, to tell other entities on the route Please let this through, this through and don't touch it. Is that an accurate description? I think that's an accurate description of the of what you present the skip, right? Yes, it is. We've been uh, been building products to this since about I, I want to say 2000, 2004, 2003. No, it's about two thousand eight for for skip for for this. So yeah. There was, yeah, there was a lot in the, in the works before it ever became a uh, product. Yep. Thank you for confirming. Ted? Right. Um, question you, in the beginning of the earlier slides uh, for this, they were mentioned about the TSBCIS specification. Um, it's kind of in the same ballpark, if you will, it's similar or not but not the same as what we're doing. I was kind of curious how that was approval for that was processed through through the group. Uh, that was a while ago. I'm not sure how many people here now are the extra member. <laughs> okay, yeah, because it was you, you mentioned in the very beginning yeah. of the of the presentation. Um, yeah, it was on the top list of the list, list of RFCs that were approved. Um, I guess since the last meeting or whatever. Oh, oh, no, that one. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, so, uh, go ahead. I, I would actually suggest talking to the media type reviewers for that. And uh, I know Murray is one, but wasn't one at that time. So it might be something where you need to ask Ned. Um, but I actually got in queue to ask a different question, um, which is actually on this slide. If I can, if I can point to this. Uh, from my understanding of your description, in addition to the two media types uh, that you have in there, you do have data streams, which you describe in this slide as uh, clear channel data. Are you anticipating a media type request separate from the video and audio media type uh, requests uh, for uh, some sort of application slash skip as well? Um, no, the, the reference to the last bullet on that slide is, is that the data present on the um, audio or video skip um, payload type, it will be treated as clear channel data. Don't mess with it. Um, Whatever is there, just let it go um, because there's, there's, there's negotiations going on. We need the end-to-end -to -end bit integrity to, to make the devices work. Um, and okay. trying to trying to look at the traffic channels not going to not going to help you much. Uh, I think you may want to uh, take another pass through the draft and in, in your description of that, uh, because that's not the same impression I got uh, with a quick look at the draft. So uh, okay, 
take a look at that. Thanks. Well, that's that's why we're here. Comments. Mm -hmm. Stefan. So, um, it, having just gone through this JPEG XS thing, where uh, it, frankly a perfectly available ISO standard uh, that just cost a little bit of money raised a big, big uproar. Um, I, I think you will all have uh, a hard time to get anything through the standard ITF process where there needs to be a reference in there to a document that's not available to the public. Um, and so far, my suggestion would be to, to target from the outset uh, to give this uh, to the independent stream or whatever it's called. So basically, not an ITF document, but still an RFC. Uh, and uh, therefore, something which most uh, network people pay some attention to. Yeah, and then we, you only have to go through a conflict review in the ITF, and that's, that's I think, much easier. Thank you. Right, and then that, that sort of goes back also to my comment about the TSVCI spec, is that it also references documents that were only available through the government. So I guess, again, sort of requesting or understanding how that process worked for that particular RFC and its approval, again, the sort of similar to what we're, what we're path, if you will, that we're asking for. Oh. Hi. Um, we, we seem to be going a little bit backwards in terms of the way the ITF handles these sorts of documents. Uh, I, I was, and I was very surprised to see that all that um, the controversy about the, um, the spec that Stefan was just talking about, because we, we've done lots of payload formats which have uh, you know, had various degrees of difficulty in accessing the specifications over the years. Um, so process-wise, I, I don't see that there should be a problem with this in IETF. Uh, and I, I think the IETF certainly should be able to um, publish open specifications that describe how to use a closed thing. Um, so I, I would sort of somewhat disagree with Stefan and say that this should go through the standard IETF process because the IETF needs to be able to do this sort of document and, and has in the past. Um, so I, I would encourage the group to adopt this and take it on as a, 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 a payload format specification in, in the usual way and work with the, the chairs to work with the area directors to, to find a way of uh, you know, uh, making making sure this is acceptable. And that, that may just mean that uh, you know, a, a small number of people uh, are given access to check that the specification makes sense. Um, because it's accessible to the community which cares, and I think that's what matters. Um, if I may speak for a minute, the, uh, that is possible to to for, um, request permission for this to for, to look at this. It's a skip standard 214.2 referenced in the R draft RFC, um, and really most of the contents that, of that document that are of any technical significance um, um, are in the draft RFC itself. Um, this. There's not much more than that. Uh, I mean, I think it probably does need someone who understands RTP um, from this you know, from, from the IETF to look at look at the the, the 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 codex specification and look at what's being proposed and say, yeah, this makes sense. Uh, yeah. But I, yeah. I don't see that it requires uh, it to be made available to the entire community. It requires it to be available to the community who will be implementing it and you know, s someone to, to look at the spec and, and say, yeah, that what's being proposed from the RTP point makes sense. Uh, and I, I'm pretty sure we've done this sort of thing before in ITFs. That's fine. Murray? Um, yeah, just on that point, the IASG recently has, uh, if you look, there's there's a BCP 97 is under revision for uh, exactly this reason. We had a number of documents come to us that um, we were not able to evaluate because the, the specification to which it referred was not available to us 
um, I think the proposal is exactly what I think Colin just said. Um, as long as the reviewers, the people who need to review it and approve it, can get access to it to make sure this, the wrapping specification is right, then it can go forward. It doesn't need to be you know permanently open public. Um, but also, but it is a problem if the reviewers can't do their jobs. That's all. Uh, we just have to. Uh, the reviewers will just have to contact the. Uh, there's a contact within the draft RFC at the bottom. Um, requesting access. Um, if we know in advance who they are, we can make sure that they get approved. Yeah, I, I think that's probably workable. Okay, so uh, do we have the action items identified? I guess we have mailing list discussion. Um, I'm not sure. Yeah. Sorry, my, my question is along the line of, of that, the action items. I, I guess um, you're suggesting that we uh, make the, doc, the, the background document, skip 214.2, available to certain people. Um, we would need to know who, and we'll help guide them through the process of who they need to, uh, to talk to. Um, and who would be on the IATF side, who would be contacting us, letting us know who needs to get access to the document? I think, I think that's probably a chair item. Is that right, Jonathan? Or we can, we can yeah. 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 So we will um, try to get back to you with, with feedback. Um, OK. I mean, I can think of some, some folks who, who might uh, might be appropriate, but we'll we'll have to discuss it. And we'll revisit the uh, draft RFC for for making it clear that the uh, the last bullet in this slide referencing it as treated as clear channel daily is 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 concise and and exact enough to specify that it's referencing just the data that is traveling within the uh, audio skip uh, or video skip um, traffic channels. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, you in? Go ahead. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Right. Cool. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> so, yeah, I first wanted to update on the AVG co-working group on uh, S-Frame uh, progress that has been made in various areas. Um, so first, you, you might already be aware that uh, the IETF S-Frame working group issued uh, a call for adoption of uh, the uh, Omar S frame draft, which is mostly talking about uh, the format itself and has some architect architecture points as well. Uh, so it was a successful call with some uh, uh, feedback that maybe the draft should be split in uh, a pure um, format based spec and a, a separate um, act architecture draft. Um, in addition to that, uh, on the mailing list or in various place, it was noted that there's interest in using a frame format either at the packet level or the frame level, uh, but not in between, which might be a, a good simplification. Also, it was noted that um, the S-frame format itself is uh, has some interest outside RTP. Um, so, for instance, you could you could use Web Transport or RTC Data Channel uh, with Web Codecs and still use S frame uh, in between to do end to end encryption. Um, so that, that means that uh, we we want integration with RTP, but uh, we also want s to be used uh, uh, outside of RTP. Um, in addition to that, uh, on the WFC side, so the API level, uh, the WebRT working group adopted uh, the WebRT and Credit Transform as a first public working draft, and the functionality already shipped in Chrome since uh, uh, maybe a year. 
And it's also enabled uh, by default in Safari Tag Preview. Uh, and it might be also uh, in, uh, in the queue for other browsers as well. So um, progress is being made to add support to allow web pages to, to use S frame or to an implement end-to-end -end encryption into browsers. Um, so the WebRT encoded transform is definitely used for end-to-end -end encryption. Uh, it's also being used either for prototype or real applications for other stuff like app-specific metadata enrichment uh, of encoded payloads. Uh, it was also used for uh, emulating, emulate, emulating red um, uh, if, if it's not available in the browser. Um, <clears throat> so so we, we are seeing that solutions are in browsers are more and more uh, using that. Uh, and we, we're seeing that uh, solution, existing web solutions are using uh, like Google Duo, FaceTime, WebEx, they're all adding progressively support for end-to-end encryption. And they're all doing that uh, with different S firm like formats and flavors. Uh, so there's no interoperability. It's, it's not the same kind of technology. It's very related, but it's not exactly the same. Uh, some workarounds are being used. And so, so it's not great. Uh, and it's not great because it's a security privacy technology. And usually having just one uh, well-identified piece of technology to, to do that is, is better. So next slide. Based on that, my understanding is really that we need to make progress. Uh, I think we already had a similar slide one year ago about that saying, hey, things are starting to evolve and uh, an encryption is being shipped and we, we need to make progress. And it's even more the case now. Um, so, and it's particularly, particularly the case for S-Frame within WebRTC eco, ecosystem. For Web Transport and Data Channel, we still have some time. But for WebRTC ecosystem, it's, it's really uh, get, getting fast there. So that means S-Frame RTP integration and S-Frame SDP integration. Um, my, my understanding in the past was that uh, AVT Core, for instance, would be responsible for doing the S-Frame RTP integration. But uh, we are seeing um, email threads on the S-Frame working mailing list about that. So first question I have to the AVT Core working group. Uh, no, previous slide. My first question would be uh, to, to be clear about uh, where should that work go, or where should it be worked on? Should, should it be all done in S frame working group, the S frame integration, or would it be better to, to do that in AVT core? Because currently I see that uh, there are discussions being done in parallel, and maybe it would be good to be clear exactly about where is going the work and w which working group is responsible for which part. Any opinion? Um, I think that probably anything where, certainly anything where like RTP architecture is implicated is best in AVT core. I feel like mm -hmm. that's where the expertise is. Um, okay. Okay. So that's, that seems reasonable. Uh, mm -hmm. For SDP integration, I guess that it should be S frame or M music, correct? Probably. Yeah. Though certainly, you know, insofar as it's, I mean, yeah, I mean, especially because it probably needs something more complicated than just what a payload format would do. So probably that needs that music integration. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. So it's good. We in AVT core. Oh, okay. Colin, Co uh, Colin? Yeah, just on that point, the, the SDP, um, I mean, obviously M, M music is the home for SDP, but the payload formats uh, are usually defined in AVT core and that spec specifies a lot of the SDP parameters. So it maybe needs review here as well. Okay, um, so, so it's great. We're in AVT core, we're discussing that. So let's try to make progress. Um, so at last meeting, we, we discussed a lot the packet versus frame issue. And uh, I think that there are common requirements in both cases. So if we put the, the packet versus frame issue aside, we can try to focus on, on common requirements. And that's what we try to do in the next slides, next few slides. Um, so yeah, the, the S-Frame working group, uh, there, there was uh, good discussions in the S-Frame working group mailing list about various approaches. And uh, basically, I think we, 
we know that middleware, uh, middleware being like SFUs, network intermediaries or browsers, cannot inspect encrypted or transformed packet payloads. Uh, but they still, especially SFUs, they still need information to route and to transform packets separately. Um, and that's especially the case in SVC simulcast cases, but it's already the case, for instance, in, uh, in non-simulcast cases. So uh, one question wa was uh, from the mailing list, whether it should be, if possible, just from RTP packet inspection to determine that content is encrypted or transformed. And if so, where should the information be located? Should it should should it be just a payload type? Should it be a dedicated RTP head, head extension? Should we put that information in RTP payload? Um, so that's feedback I, I'd like to get from uh, Evitico folks. Colin? Hi, uh, I'm a little uh, confused about what you mean by this question <laughs> because um, my understanding is that the payload type defines what what is within the RTP payload. So I'm not sure what you mean by the separate the separate uh, points there. Um, so currently, in uh, the current and deployed uh, environments, the payload type is uh, defining uh, the the codec. So let's say H six four VPI HTTP nine. Um, and we, we need we need at some point this information anyway. Uh, and that's how it's being deployed. But uh, we could also say that, no, that's wrong. And the payload type should say, oh, it's encrypted content or it's content that you, you, you do not need to care. It's, it's opaque. And that's one possibility. Uh, so I, I don't think that's what the payload type does in RTP, that the payload type defines the payload format, and the payload format describes what codec it is and how it is packetized. And so if, uh, you know, it specifies what's the contents of the RTP payload. Um, yeah, I, that, I mean, the only thing is that it was, uh, I mean, it was raised uh, in, uh, in some discussion of the main disease that maybe just signaling that in the SDP that the content was, uh, even if it is just, uh, and we don't change the packet decision of the codec, just uh, increasing the, the payload, uh, the, the payload of the, of the of the RTP packet that it could go from the, within the the same payload time. But for example, me, I think that it will have a different payload type to specify that it is not uh, the, the normal payload type. So this is a, it is not a, um, we are saying what is the solution is that some people has claimed that uh, it could be done in a different way. So just we were seeking guidance about exactly if um, if this could be an, an option or we should just, uh, if we should, for example, say and sending uh, an RTP packet with with payload, the payload type negotiation for VP8, then the payload must be VP8 and, and, and uh, less fee or whatever can inspect it in an expect to, to have the, the correct uh, payload in there. Um, so I, I think that there's sort of separate issue, issues here. I mean, um, you know, one is how you signal it and one is what is the payload format. Um, but you know the the, the 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 question on the slide about you know, is this located in the, the payload type or within the RTP payload? That I mean that they're the same thing. So you, you may, are you asking about the way that the the data is encoded into the packet, or the way the the data is, or the way the contents of the packets are signaled? Mm. So yeah, I, I was trying to, to, to cover the fact that um, in VS Frame uh, working mailing list, there, there was a, a, a proposal and um, um, usually you, you could say, oh, I want to negotiate VP8 because that's really what I want. And I want also to, to use this frame. Um, so then you need to provide that information, the fact that you're using VP8 and the fact that you, you're using S frame uh, to the other party. And this information, VP8 plus uh, S frame, 
could go also in the active packet or it could be left elsewhere and so on. And that's uh, what, what I would like to, to hear about. Because we, we think that getting both information, the fact that, yeah, it is, uh, it's EP8 and yeah, it's, um, it's encrypted, it's transformed, uh, would be useful in, by looking at uh, RTP packets. Yeah, uh, I mean, uh, I think my, my argument here would be if you're changing what, what is the payload, then that's a different payload format. And maybe that's some sort of encapsulation payload format. But uh, it, it seems strange to say this is VP8, but the content isn't actually VP8. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sounds good. Uh, Bernard? I think what uh, there's a couple of distinct issues, as Colin said. One is the negotiation of specific RTP header extensions, like we've had the frame marking header extension. There's the dependency descriptor. You know, the, there's routing information that's being negotiated. Um, that really does not tell you anything about what's in the payload, although people have been using it as a, a kind of a hint of what might be in the payload. Like it, you know, you, it's likely to be encrypted, but it doesn't really tell you that explicitly. And the thing is that you could negotiate those RTP header extensions without encrypting the payload, right? So, um, and then there's the payload type, which is, or, and negotiation of things like the codec. But again, that currently doesn't tell you whether the payload itself is encrypted. So it's, it seems to me like there's something missing in there. Um, and I know there's been discussions on the S-Frame mailing list about whether you really want to even tell the SFU that you're encrypting it or it's none of the SFU's business. Um, so I know there's there's that um, issue because really the the encrypted payload is really an end-to-end -end thing and, and SDP really isn't about that, it's hop by hop. Um, but uh, I think it's a little bit dangerous to assume that because you've negotiated a particular header extension that uh, everything will work end-to-end -end with an encrypted payload. Uh, because there could be, as we just talked about with the B2B UAs, right? There could be somebody in the middle who's looking at this and if the SDP doesn't, tell it that to give it any inkling that it's encrypted it probably could be uh, could become a problem at some point um, so I, I think there is a missing piece that's maybe none of the some of the information I think is in none of the none of the things you described or it's not a halo type it's not a header extension it's probably something else in this oh yeah. uh, yes I mean it seems to me like conceptually what this actually should be I mean insofar as Everything in the RTP session will be S frame, which I think is what people probably want because you don't, because I think having this be mixed is a security and you know nightmare. I think what this actually is is a profile, much like SAVP is a profile. Um, this is a new transformation like SAVP, um, which uh, I mean, I don't know if you necessarily, I mean, whether you actually negotiate it that way for backward compatibility reasons is a separate issue, but um, I feel like. You know that might be at least conceptually the cleanest way to approach it, and if we have to hack something to get it to work with browsers or whatever, so be it. Um, but I know that certainly, especially for you know, the problem with having it be a, a payload type is a the payload type um, multiplication issues, and um, also just the I don't know if you want to be able to negotiate both, you know. S frame and non S frame in the same session because that sounds like a good way to accidentally discover you're not end to end encrypted or not discover it or worse. Uh, so ah, uh, thanks, Jonathan. I, I, I think we, we uh, there's a tight situation here uh, between the signaling layer and and the RTP layer here, or uh, even the SFU to make some decisions. It's, it's not, they're not uh, two different islands. They have to be uh, combined together in any business logic that you apply on a per packet basis. And STP is the one that sets up some uh, kind of stream level indications. And, uh, and speaking here, just in terms of the RTP layer, it, it's a bit kind of not thinking about what happens in the set setting up there. And, and uh, I did did uh, see some of the discussions that are happening on the S-Frame mailing list about you know saying uh, uh, for for a media stream level 
or for, for or for the particular payload type um, applicability that if if this is an uh, S frame or on S packet, that that way uh, for it's kind of hint to the an FTP offerance can be de de defined explicitly to, uh, to say what the behavior should be. Uh, they saying it's a hint uh, to the SF utility. It's saying that you know you no, don't look into the packet further because it's end-to-end -end encrypted. It, you don't get anything. Versus uh, something like if it's if it is not an end-to-end uh, -end encrypted thing, you can look into the packet to see, for example, the audio uh, level or something like that. And hence having some, we, we need to kind of uh, sort of look into the picture of the signaling and the media to make a decision. Just looking at the RTP there would kind of uh, leave a bigger uh, the system setup that's happening here, and we need to consider that as well. Um, no. Yeah, I think um, conceptually, I, I agree with uh, Jonathan. That the first thing I thought conceptually was also uh, profile level things like that, SAVP or something like that. If I was an originalist, I would say that, that would be the right precedent and model to, to use. However, uh, I'm not an originalist, and I don't believe that I decided. Uh, long ago should impact everything today and i think i would argue that savp has caused a lot more damage than uh th than good um and there's been a lot of problems with you know things like uh, stuff for security and things like that. i would i would caution against trying to do what logically makes sense for us wise is to, is to make a new you know profile out of this um but i, I think that's that's probably a mistake that, that rehashes a lot of the mistakes that, that those older profiles caused. What makes more logical sense to me is this is just an encapsulation, like like red or FEC or anything else. It's an encapsulation of of, a, of some other payload. So I think it makes more logical sense to declare all the real payloads and then also declare the encapsulated uh, types. And then what you actually send on the wire is the encapsulated type. So it would be a different payload type number. Um, and it would just be an encapsulation of some other payload type that is also in the STP, but won't appear on the wire because you're not actually sending that format on the wire. That's what I think makes more logical sense. Colin? Um, yeah, I, I think I agree with what, what I just said, that this to me does not make sense as a, a profile. Um, I think it's entirely the wrong level of modifications to be represented as a profile. Um, it, it strikes me as a wrapper format, much more like um, your red or the re retransmission formats uh, also. Uh, and I think what, what you are specifying here is a wrapper format, which says that the content is, for example, VP8, but encrypted. Um, and so, so I, I do think, so. You know, the, I don't think this is a a codec agnostic payload format. I think this is a codec specific format which wraps, you know, something which which wraps a particular set of content. So what you're signaling is is that this is this wrapper format, and what is being wrapped is this. You and you know the 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 existing payload format gets put into the, the wrapper, perhaps with an additional header uh, added before the front of it, and is signaled as a payload type. Um, in, wrapping some existing payload type. Yeah, uh, okay. okay, I think. Uh, yeah. So I just want to respond. I mean, I think that's probably a fine solution. I think the SDP part's gonna have to be a little tricky because if you wanna say, I'm willing to receive wrapped VP8, I do not want to receive unwrapped VP8, but I think that might be more an M music consideration than a, uh, ABT core consideration per se. Yeah, I think it's a, it's a good yeah. issue to, to tackle as well yeah. and to, to keep track of. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree there's probably some signaling issues. I suspect they're not that different to the ones we use for some of the retransmission or um, redundancy format. <coughs> okay. I guess we'll need to work that through. Okay, sounds good. Okay, uh, we don't have a lot of time, but uh, maybe this is my, yeah, we could say it's my last, my slide. No, go above, mm. uh, um, previous slide. Yeah, so I think from what I hear is consensus that 
we need an ability to identify whether it's encrypted and transform and also the um, underlying um, codec type. Uh, I'm less sure about whether it's good, whether there's consensus on uh, having a solution that is independent of the exact transform and frame format. Uh, it seems to me that it would be good to have um, because what we're seeing it's being deployed, there are various S frame or transform being used. And so um, the wrapper format will only be able to, will not, we, we don't want to have a wrapper format for each and exact transform S frame uh, uh, transform. And uh, yeah, the scope is really related to web RTC audio video codecs only. So there's a limited known set of codecs that we want to sort and, and it's a fully generic solution in, in, in any way. The target is only web RTC audio video codecs. Um, so yes, you're on to. Any question here? Going back to uh, the first slide of uh, uh, having different uh, systems in, uh, implementing S frame versus S packet in different uh, uh, different phase, the like Google FaceTime versus WebEx and those kind of things. Uh, I'm uh, going back to if, if you go with an alternative payload format or some kind of wrapping payload format, how how would that uh, level of um, interoperability be achieved between the two different implementation of the S frame or what is the packet? So are we are we kind of saying that we have to do one versus the other, or or are we saying we we don't talk about that and somehow the implementations need to figure it out? Um, uh, it's an open question. I don't think that there's consensus on uh, or uh, uh, on anything there yet. Um, what what is known now is that uh, it's either a packet law or a frame law. Uh, we are not in a team, a more complex case, uh, but other than that, uh, since there are implementation, implementation supporting packet and implementation supporting frame level, so in those like may we'll to pop off and, and then. Uh, We'll, we'll, we'll see from there. Or maybe we can get some consensus on picking just one. Okay. Uh, I think so for me. Okay. Colin? Hi, uh, so, so I realize we're out of time, but uh, so I, I saw Justin's co comment in the chat about we want to apply S frame packetization rather than VP8 packetization. Uh, and uh, this, this perhaps comes to the heart of what's what's the issue here. Um, I, I was, my understanding was that what you wanted to do was take um, you know, VP8 content you know, in, in the same way it's usually packetized, encrypt it, and then put it into a new payload format. Um, which seems to be the model that I was talking about and I thought Mo was talking about. But if, if Justin's talking about doing something different, then, then perhaps we need to have a, a conversation to make sure we're all understanding that the same thing about what's, what's meant here. You know, it would seem that you pack, packetize v, you know, v, the, the things you would put you packetize it for VP8 as if you were going to put it in the packet, encrypt it, and then put it in the packet as S frame with VP8 inside. But if that's not what's being proposed, then I think we've got a bigger discussion to have. Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry we this discussion got cut a little short by other things running over time. I feel like this needs more discussion. Um, uh, so we should try to figure out what's the best place to have this discussion. Uh, would people be, well, we tried to do an interim on this before, didn't really have the right take up, but if we can get the right people in a room, an interim or perhaps a more informal side meeting might be helpful just so we can sort of get convergence on, make sure everybody's talking about the same things architecturally. Um, are there any interest in that? Quickly, hopefully. Justin says yes. Colin says yes. Uh, OK, 
okay, we'll try to, as Sue asked, says yes, okay, we'll try to have some, try to plan something out on the list for that. Uh, so, um, all right, that seems reasonable. Um, go ahead. I think we've reached the end of the meeting and we want okay. to thank everyone for coming. Okay, the, other, the only other thing I wanted to raise is that Spencer um, mentioned earlier on the uh, RTP over quick discussions, we think uh, probably having specifically RTP over quick discussions on the AUT list would be best, whereas more general media over quick on the mock list. Uh, so just to keep things somewhat separable, so somewhat separate there, that's probably the best organization for that. And with that, thank you all for coming and uh, we will see you at uh, uh, other sessions here or next time, possibly in person. And we'll, we'll uh, arrange for an interim on the uh, S-frame issues. Hopefully we can get some convergence on that. We'll discuss that on the last. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>